thank you very much for the opportunity to share some of our thinking. Um, I'm from the Protected Areas Research Group. I just want to uh, also acknowledge my um, partner in crime, Rhys Albert, sitting here in front. Uh, that's all here can't be here, and Claudine Ruiz also um, unfortunately cannot be here. So our research focus is, is very much on the future of protected areas, one of our key sort of research thinking areas. And, um, and this work links, links onto that. So what I'm gonna share in this presentation is, a, um, is a, a moral argument put forward by um, Peter Singer, and then I'm gonna inject two uh, moral assumptions into that to contextualize the argument for the protected areas context, and then we'll see um, what we all think of that. So, so the question we have is, uh, what is our South African societal moral obligation to protected areas? And, um, and we turn to this paper, which um, the first time I came across this paper was actually um, as a planning student 25 years ago. We did a module on planning ethics, and it's a paper by uh, Peter Singer, Famine, Affluence and Morality, that really resonated with me um, at the time. Um, and then the paper is essentially about moral obligations and moral equivalence, which we'll, which we'll get to. It was written within the context of, of famine in, in, um, in India um, in the 70s. And, and Peter Singer was reflected. He's an eco-ethicist. He was with Princeton University. He's now in Melbourne. Um, but he reflected on what's the moral obligation of the developed world towards dealing with these global global famines or global catastrophes. Um, so um, there's just two important concepts that I just need to clarify before we get to, to Peter Singer's moral argument. Um, the one is uh, a supererogatory action, which is an act that would be good to do, but not wrong if you don't do it. It's typically giving money to charity. It's good if you do it. If you don't do it, you're not judged by society if you don't do it. Um, and then obligatory actions, obligatory mor moral actions. Those are the two key concepts that he, that he grapples with in his, in his argument. So I'm gonna try and summarize the paper in one slide. So my fear is always that Peter Singer will walk through the door at the back <laughs> and just tell me why. <laughs> that's just absolutely not what I said. But um, let's, let's see, um, the, uh, the, it's very interesting that there's been, I mean, over the years, a lot of debate about this moral argument, but it sort of stood the test of time. Um, it's very difficult, I think, to challenge what he, what he argues. So, um, so firstly, so I'm just gonna run through it, and I'm gonna read through it. Um, if it's in your power to prevent something very bad from happening without suffering anything of moral significance, then we must morally do it. That's the first, maybe the most controversial sort of statement, um, moral statement. So we could be thinking about what, what does very bad mean and what does moral significance mean. Um, then um, hunger, disease and other suffering, disability and death are very bad. I think we can all agree on that. And then uh, three, the luxuries on which we spend money are not of moral significance. Um, so it's not morally equivalent with the very bad things that happen. Uh, by donating money to relief agencies like Oxfam, we could prevent hunger, disease, and other sources of suffering, disability, and death. In other words, we have a moral obligation to donate the money we spend on luxuries to relief agencies. That's the moral, basic moral argument. And it would have been interesting to have a bit of a discussion on this and workshop this. Um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to challenge, but there's, there's quite a bit of writing on that if you are interested um, discussing this. But this is, this is what the, so, so we, we went back to this moral argument and said, well, what can we learn from this? How can we apply this within the protected areas con context? So the two moral assumptions that we will be injecting into this moral argument, the one would be from a, what we would call an anthropocentric ethical worldview that views only humans to have intrinsic value, and the other moral assumption will be from a more ecocentric uh, worldview um, where all living things have equal intrinsic value. So just within the protected areas context, 
typically, theoretically, it's argued that special night reserves and wilderness areas sort of leans towards a more ecocentric ethical framing and um, that the ideas of mixed land use areas, sustainable use areas, this is IUCN categories, of course, on the other side of the spectrum, more on the anthropocentric side. Um, I've come to the conclusion that I think actually all our protected areas sits on this side, and I'm not sure that we have a typology anymore. If you look at the objectives of different protected areas, they're pretty much the same, whether it's a protected environment or a national park, or, but anyway, maybe that's a discussion for a different, a different forum. Okay, you can also plug in here the whole idea of traditional conservation and so-called new conservation which is some of the dimensions being discussed in the literature. Good, so let's, let's go through the first moral assumption using um, Singer's, Singer's moral argument. So this talks to the issue of luxuries. What is a luxury? Okay, within that moral argument. So if we say that protected areas are social luxuries, i.e. lack moral equivalence between protected areas and poverty alleviation, Okay, that's the, that's how, so let's build this, this argument. Um, some pointers to support this, um, this moral view. Um, this the whole idea that protected areas need to pay their way, uh, decrease in political support for these areas, decrease in budgets, erosion of boundaries, increase in deep proclamations, which we've seen. And then even expansion of the types of protected areas that derive protection obligations, support of access, monetization. If you, if you consider um, this approach or the idea that protected areas are luxuries, these would be the typical arguments that you'll put forward to support this, this view. So, so let's go through the argument. If it's in your power to prevent something very bad from happening without suffering anything of moral significance, then we must morally do it. Hunger disease and these things are all very bad. Um, Protected areas on which we spend money are not of moral significance, if we consider them to be luxuries. By sacrificing protected areas, we could prevent hunger, disease, and bad things from happening. Therefore, uh, we must morally, we are obliged morally to sacrifice these areas to avoid bad things from happening, which is poverty alleviation. So. So if you, if, you, if you then accept that having protected areas are luxuries, it puts you in a very difficult moral position um, in terms of defending these areas in the context of alleviating poverty. The moral assumption too, which is on the ecocentric side, would argue that losing protected areas is a very bad thing. We've got this 30 by 30 idea, um, there's a lot of persistence of fortress conservation thinking. There's many NGOs, I think, that sort of support this, this view, so it's also out there. So again, um, if it's in your power to prevent something very bad from happening without suffering anything of significance, then we must morally do it. Losing protected areas is very bad. Uh, the luxuries in which we spend money are not of moral significance. And therefore, by now donating money to our conservation agencies, WWF, uh, we could prevent losing protected areas. We therefore must donate the money we spend on luxuries to conservation agencies. This is the other side of the moral argument. Everybody's just agreeing, and I just see it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay. Unfortunately, we haven't solved anything because we just got two polarizing uh, moral views. Here. <laughs> Okay, so what does this mean for, um, for framing of policy? So what is our South African societal moral obligation to protected areas? Um, so we know that anthropocentrism dominates policy. We've done quite a bit of work on this. We are essentially in an anthropocentric policy paradigm um, that is explicit in our law. Um, so if we ask the questions, are protected areas a societal luxury? If we say yes, then we have no moral basis to sustain them and we are morally obliged to sacrifice them. If losing protected areas, is losing protected areas a bad thing? If it's not, uh, then no, uh, the, uh, if no, then we have no moral basis to sustain them and we are morally obliged to sacrifice them also. So in conclusion, um, 
what is our South African societal moral obligation to protected areas? I should have, just to um, avoid avoid um, controversy, I should have put a question mark there. <laughs> okay. Uh, none from a policy perspective. Protected areas are incompatible to prevailing societal moral framings in South Africa. That's what we would argue purely because the policy position is anthropocentric. Um, and yeah, I suppose that's now up for up for discussion. Um, yeah, so we we wonder if protected areas are maybe it's 150 year old concept, maybe it's had its shelf life, and um, yeah, maybe we're moving on to other things, which is um, are we just talking from a policy moral perspective? Okay, thank you very much. I think that's that.